Norse Code is the largest and only division of Norse Code LLC. You can find Norse Code on the Daily Norseman, SB Nation's Vikings blog at dailynorseman.com. You can also find it on iTunes, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, Google Play, and wherever fine podcasts are aggregated. Our Vikings blogger extraordinaire and generally useful human Minnesota Arifa Vikings. Of- I'm your host, producer. My name is James Sagasi. Thank you guys so and much for listening. And he can be listening. found at Arifa Song NFL. I am have your producer and host, and, and, host, and, host. and my name is James Sagasi. You know Pagashin. him from numerous blogs and podcasts. You can find me at the, the show's internet, official Twitter from feed. From Pro at Norse Code Network. DM. He is or my personal human account and mac and cheese Mono. enthusiast. If you'd like to Aretha donate a few bucks to the show, you can do so in a few I've different ways. I've got to ask. You can go to patreon.com slash Norse Code today. and donate there. Mm-hmm. For three dollars and fifty cents a month, you get bonus do they follow you around the room you like you did with the picture from the Laquan Treadwell for a one-time donation. Or you can go to norsecode.threadless.com and pick up some Norse Code merchandise. Okay, so here's the weird thing. Any questions or comments that cannot fit in a tweet can be sent to Norse Code Podcast. He looks straight at me and he whispers, on behalf of the North I Coast know. Staff, thank you and so no one else seems to catch it. I asked people if they this. saw it. They, they said no. The he was just talking to the uh, Amazon commentator um, that he never even looked in this direction. But I know what I saw, James. Uh, right? Like, this is... It's not okay. It's not, it's not okay. Nope. No part of this is okay. Uh, in case you were unaware, Arif is currently <laughs> on assignment. Let's, on assignment. Let's, yeah. let's refer to it as yeah. that on assignment in Arizona, uh, going between Super Bowl media events and and trying to find the gay Denny's. Yeah, that's important. Yeah, it's uh, I've it's a local legend around here. I got to make sure. So it turns out uh, I didn't know this until today. Uh, if you just Google it, you'll find it in Google Maps. It's just there. So uh, I got to stop relying on. Um, Word of mouth and uh, and make it over to the the gay Denny's that's marked on by Google Maps. Yeah, of of all of all silly things, I, I feel like this is this is an important landmark in Phoenix that uh, that is worth checking out. Uh, well, welcome to this episode of Norse Code. Hope you guys are all doing well. We took an extended period of time off because the Vikings couldn't figure out what they were doing at defensive coordinator. Right. Uh, so we've got like this off season schedule, right? And it's like you know we go every other. And uh, we thought like the Vikings were like a day or two away from naming a guy. So we're like, ah, we'll just wait until they name a guy because, you know, with our luck that we'll put together a show. And then the very next day, it, they'll they'll have a new defensive coordinator and we won't be able to cover it. So just, that's just like what happened with last episode when we literally opened with draw play Dave asking if they, if we'd fired at Donatel yet. And then the next day right. they fired right. at Donatel. <laughs> <laughs> right. So we were cognizant of this problem. And we anticipated, we didn't realize it's like, uh, you know, the British are with carrying an umbrella, right? Like if you if you bring an umbrella out with you, it won't rain um, and vice versa. Um, we were controlling the timing of the hiring without knowing it. So uh, we could have accelerated this process. Yeah, that's, that's on us. Um, we could have accelerated this process by recording a show about a week and a half ago. Uh, and they would have had uh, a coordinator, not necessarily Flores, but they would have had a coordinator. Um, a day later so that's on us our bad um, but that's you know that's that's how life works yeah and between that and you going down for super bowl week for media stuff like this has just been a <laughs> comedy of errors <laughs> like, yeah yeah <laughs> she was like hey uh so they just they just got a guy um do you want to do you want to record an episode about it i mean i was like yeah that makes sense that seems smart uh james can you do uh midnight uh, can you can you oh it was midnight there it was like one or two here <laughs> yeah like, right yeah Mid- uh, midnight mountain time you could record at like one uh and that's that's when i'm free <laughs> <laughs> like no no i think uh i think we're gonna end up waiting a day or two <laughs> I, uh, unless something horrible happens like with indianapolis and uh and and what's his name uh i don't think he's i think he's still gonna be the coach in two days I think we'll be fine. Right. Yeah, I think we'll we'll probably be fine, fingers crossed. Yeah. Well, we're we're going to get into that in just a moment. But again, thank you guys so much for listening to Norse Code. 
If you enjoy the show and would like to help the show financially, you can do so in a couple of different ways. You can go over to patreon.com slash Norse code and get access to things like the bonus material and get access to things like the discord. I did put out a bonus episode at the end of the month, uh, at the end of January. So you can check that out and listen to the only time as far as I know that a reef has stopped the show completely with something he said. <laughs> I, I stopped. I went, no, we need to, we need to figure out what's going on. I need to stop laughing. No. And then we tried to start and you were still broken. So I, my know, favorite part is have you fun. have no idea what this is about. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like, oh, James is raving about something I said and it was funny. Great. My ego yeah, is fed. What, what what do you think? I, I don't let's let's take guesses on what I say. <laughs> I'll give you a clue. It involves CJ Ham. So, uh, yeah, I'm still lost. Oh, perfect, excellent. It's it's <laughs> it's, it's it's most definitely the last clip in that uh, in that bonus episode. Perfect. So, yeah, if you're interested in such silliness. And like, there's like legitimate tears of laughter happening from me during it. It was so bad. <laughs> but uh, check it out over at patreon.com slash Norse code. Special thank you to a few uh, very, very wonderful people who uh, who are supporting us over on Patreon. And it's because it's been a couple of days. Uh, let's just knock these out right now. Brady Johnson, thank you so much. Timothy Lopez, Sean, uh, we'll do uh, Ian, Ian Brower as well. And uh, Aaron Rupar, apologies if that's... Uh, Rupert or Rupar. But uh, thank you guys so much for pledging over at Patreon. Again, this is how we're able to afford things like sending us to, I say London, but sending us to do like live shows, uh, to be able to afford. S- s- sending the podcast, kind of yes. generally speaking, to London. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that. Let's let's go with that. <laughs> you know, a win for one of us is a win for all of us, James. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm starting to get on d- the dusty side of that one. <laughs> Now that now that it's applied to me. Oh, no. Well, anyway, <laughs> patreon.com slash Norse code helps us afford basically everything, keeps us ad free and keeps the show going. Uh, you can also go to paypal.me slash Norse code as well if you'd like to do a one time donation. Or you can go over to norsecode.threadless.com and be like draw play Dave, who was posting pictures on Twitter of his new uh, of his new uh, shower curtain that I sent while we were recording the show. <laughs> And yeah, really, and uh, and he and he was so proud he posted it, which that meant a lot of other people learned about the shower curtain and were uh, just equally disturbed based on the comments. Okay, so worryingly, not enough people were disturbed. Oh, yes, does bother me because it wasn't a universal. What's going on? This <laughs> bothers me. I'm weirded out. If that was universal. I'd have a little bit more hope. Yep. Um, but we had like a 90% disturbed, 10% intrigued At, ratio. Well, uh, 8% Not in, uh, 8% intrigued, 2% does that come in Seahawks colors. Oh, okay. Yeah. I, I So I did categorize that as intrigued. But yeah, that's a fair <laughs> um, separation. No, it doesn't. And it never will. Well, we, we'll, we'll, we'll figure something out if he really wants it. But uh, yeah, norsecode.threadless.com. Pick up your Norse Code merch today. All right. So, obviously, the big news involves the hiring of the defensive coordinator. Uh, This is, I say, a long time coming. It felt like a longer process because of whatever Denver was doing, deciding on, A, their head coach, and, B, deciding if they were going to let people out of their contract. People kept getting hired. Brian Mm -hmm. Flores is the pick. Famously... Uh, was let go from the Dolphins and uh, has a, a nice little lawsuit involving the league and it involved some uh, some lost draft picks from the uh, from the Dolphins served as a uh, served as a member of the coaching staff over on the Steelers and is now the defensive coordinator for the Minnesota Vikings. I want to separate these three things. So I want to talk about this in like three different ways. So first I want to go over why was this a great hire for Minnesota? I also want to ask why is this a terrible hire for Minnesota and why is this both? So let's start with great. Why is this a great move for Minnesota? 
Well, I mean, first of all, addition by subtraction, you no longer have Ed Donatel. I think that that helps. Um, but I think also uh, it signifies a couple of things. One, it signifies that Kevin O'Connell is not wedded to any particular understanding of the way that he wants defense to work. You know, it, it sounds like, you know, because last year he was very adamant that, um, you know, this kind of too high defense where you start every single snap with the two high safeties and then you kind of convert to what you're going to do. You know, he was he was really enamored with that, you know, given all of the problems that the Rams had with that kind of look. Uh, and so, you know, he, he very much sought out a defense. Now it seems like he's seeking out talent. He knows that Brian Flores is talented. He doesn't really care how results happen so long as they happen. So I think that that's good. It shows flexibility, I think, on the part of the head coach. The second thing is uh, Brian Flores does seem to be talented. It's always very difficult to um, predict what uh, <laughs> you're going to get out of uh, a, a defensive coordinator, even if you have a history of them being a defensive coordinator. Um, but I think that you take a look at what Flores is able to do, particularly with the Miami Dolphins defense, but also what he was able to do with the Patriots defense, that 2018 defense uh, where he was the play caller was was really phenomenal. I think that the Dolphins, them turning around, you know, wasn't, uh, you know, wasn't going to be inevitable or anything like that. But I thought uh, the way that that defense operated was uh, kind of intriguing and exciting, certainly way, way better than what the Vikings were able to do. Um, that doesn't mean it was, I don't think it was like a, a historically great defense over the course of his three years there. It did get better though over time. And I think that that's important. Um, but yeah, it, it, I think tells us that there is flexibility. This is somebody that's so talented that, uh, a year after, uh, he decided to file a lawsuit against the NFL and there was a, essentially a soft understanding that he might get blackballed a year after that, he starts getting uh, head coaching interviews. So definitely people seem to be interested despite all of that. And it just kind of took that to get kind of washed away. And that judgment of his peers as somebody who's that talented, that kind of deserves those opportunities, I think is worth taking a look at as somebody that uh, probably knows how to coach. You know, and that's kind of one of, like you mentioned getting the head coaching things and we can kind of transition into the the negative side of this. One of the things that people are mentioning as a negative for the Brian Flores hire is that, oh, he's he's going to get a head coaching interview next year and he's going to leave. So we're going to have a one year thing and we're going to be right back to where we started. That is a bit presumptuous, isn't it? It is. But like the thing that is kind of interesting about that is that that is probably in the arena of things that are the best case scenario. Right. Because the only like if the defense isn't good next year. I think it's really unlikely. I'm not saying it's impossible. I think this happened with Aaron Glenn. Um, But I think it's really unlikely that he gets a bunch of head coaching interviews. It really only occurs in a world where that defense is doing a pretty good job. Uh, So, yeah, it would suck to lose somebody right after you hire them. But I think that only occurs in a scenario where you're pretty happy, where the Vikings uh, not only make the playoffs again, but probably advance a little bit just because we do have a trust or an understanding that that offense is going to do pretty well, which by the way, it did all right, you know? Um, but we have an understanding that that's going to do better. We're kind of used to seeing this offense kind of flirting with top 10 territory. And then if the defense is good enough for this guy to get hired, then probably, you know, not only are you making the playoffs, you're probably winning a game or two. So yeah, that's bad. That's not great that you'd only have them for a year, but it's not as bad as it sounds because it means it comes with a pretty good defensive season. I mean, it would be nice to have one of those. It's it's certainly been a few years since we had exposure to that, but it's it just seemed a bit kind of cart before the horse sort of thing. You know, doom before any possible version of success sort of thing. Well, I mean, it, it seems kind of like inherent in being a Vikings fan, right? To envision the worst possible scenario of a thing that you're already optimistic about. God, you know, I'm, I'm with this great person. I, they're going to cheat on me. I just know it. But I'm with this great person yeah, right I'm not, now. Yeah, they're going to cheat on me because I'm just not good enough for them. Yeah. I'm just not good enough for them. That's a, It's going to be my fault. <sighs> they're going to be the head coach of the boy. Who's going to be terrible in two years? I, I want to uh, say, uh, I was going to say, well, I was okay. going to say Denver again, but. So, <laughs> I, the, uh, my worry is the Houston Texans. They'd be they'd be firing three black coaches after one year in a row. I mean, it's absolutely within the realm of possibilities. Oh though. yeah, yeah. And then and then they're gonna interview Brian Flores, and he's gonna be like, "Are you serious right now?" <laughs> Tell you what, how about 
we do an opposite Rooney thing. <laughs> yeah, I'll be your please. only black candidate. Just like please. six okay, or seven other fun- white guys. Yeah, we we all made fun of you when you wanted to go out and get Josh McCown. Please just do us all a favor and go and get Josh McCown. <laughs> he's, he's right there. He, yeah. He's lonely. He's anywhere. He's, <laughs> yeah. And clearly the Colts have proven this is something that can work at least once. <laughs> well, it can happen at least once. I don't know. Well, no, I was just referring to the one win. I think that, that was all I was doing. Oh, that's, yeah. Well, then, yeah. Yeah, no, for sure. Yeah. <laughs> we're doing the opposite of the Rooney rule. Uh, so why is this a terrible thing for the Vikings? Well, I I think that it commits the Vikings to uh, chasing a personnel grouping necessarily that they don't really have. Um, now, if, if I wanted to talk about Brian Flores in a little bit more detail, we could probably bring up the fact that the Patriots defenses historically have done a very good job of adapting to the players that they have, but you can't ignore that if you include all of his time in Miami and you include the time in uh, New England, it's a particular style of defense, one that is single high safety very often, one that is uh, blitzing a fair amount. The Miami defense last year blitzed more than any other defense in the NFL, or sorry, the last year that Brian Flores was the D.C., uh, so in 2021. Um, you take a look at his uh, 2019 to 2021 performance, um, and it was, a, again, a very heavy man coverage team, a very blitz-heavy team. And though last year that defense was pretty good, it was like ninth, for example, in um, net yards allowed per drop back. I think it was fourth, I want to say, in expected points uh, in total on defense. It was a good defense in 2021, um, which, you know, made his firing all the more kind of curious. But, you know, over the course of those three years, it was a little bit above average. So we don't have um, a guaranteed history that the defenses that he's run have been elite. And importantly, um, I said the 2018 New England defense was good. It was the 2019 defense after he left. That 2019 defense was one of the best defenses we'd seen um, over the past, you know, eight, nine years. It was an incredible defense that happened after he left. So that's something you kind of have to uh, to ask. Um, so we know that New England traditionally adapts, like I said, but the question of whether or not they have the personnel to do what Brian Flores has been doing over the past four years I think it's fair. I don't know that Minnesota has the horses to do uh, a really man coverage heavy st- uh, scheme. I don't know that you take a look at those three safeties. I don't know that it makes a lot of sense to always be in cover one, given who those safeties are and the investment that they've made. Um, you know, it, I don't know that you've got like a, a great single high center fielder like an Earl Thomas. Um, and you need to be kind of comfortable blitzing. The Vikings you know, let their best, blitz, best blitzer walk in free agency, became a member of the Dallas Cowboys. Um, and while Jordan Hicks was like fine at blitzing, I think we all kind of understand he's not necessarily going to be on the roster next year. Eric Hendricks is okay at blitzing. Um, Brian Asamoa, I, I still just kind of want to see more, but that was not a skill set I had considered him to have coming out of Oklahoma. Um, I was not entirely accurate about, you know, what I thought about him at coming out of Oklahoma. He seems to have already played better than that. But I am still concerned that he's probably not a great blitzing linebacker, and that's kind of really critical to the scheme. So um, I'm worried about the kind of fits that the Vikings have. Um, I, I did believe that the Vikings needed to play more man coverage, needed to blitz more often, but not because they were a man coverage or a blitz heavy uh, team by talent, but rather because uh, they needed to vary things more. I don't think it was the ideal uh, scheme for them. I think it was just better to pepper more of that in. Now, kind of moving that into the likely thing that they'll major in, I'm not sure it's a good fit. So um, those are probably, you know, the pros and the cons. You also have to consider, like, I don't know how well we can be confident in New England coaches outside of New England. I know that I just said, um, you know, a couple episodes ago that Gerard Mayo would have been an ideal candidate. And I still believe that just like I believe Brian Flores is good. But if it fails, it'll probably be for some similar reasons. And I'd probably be, by the way, wrong about Gerard Mayo if that's the case. Um, which is that, you know, these Patriots guys can't seem to adapt what they do outside of New England. Very much seemed like Brian Flores could, but then you have these questions about why he was fired, his ability to work with, uh, you know, uh, the front office, his ability to kind of adapt what he needed to do, his ability to build personal relationships in a way that's really meaningful, whether or not, um, you know, the players bought into what he did, right, which long-term is going to be important, even if short-term it works. Um, if those questions are like real and not manufactured by teams trying to leak things in order to make them look bad, um, then that's another reason to be concerned. So, uh, yeah, I, I think that there's reasons to be concerned. I think on balance, though, 
Um, I think that this is a great hire, but if, if, if it goes wrong, I imagine it's going to be for one of those two primary reasons I just outlined. So why is this both good and bad then? Like what's, what's the middle ground on this? It seems like people are in both extreme camps. Yeah. Yeah. That's probably fair. I would say that, um, most of his play calling career has been with a mediocre defense not a great one, better than the one that they ran over the past two years, right? Either under Zimmer or Donatel. But it's mostly actually been mediocre. Uh, you know, his time in Miami, and that's when he had, like, you know, Xavier Howard, right? Um, his time in Miami has not been filled with you know, just rock-solid defenses every single season. So it might just be an average defense, and we're pumping up a guy um, because we perceive him to be unjustly fired, Right or that the NFL kind of deserves to lose a lawsuit here or there, right? We might be interested in this guy because he has a reputation for being really smart, but we haven't really necessarily seen it play out in terms of its effect on the field. Um, he's kind of got, you know, according to a lot of us, me included, the justice on his side, and it'd be kind of cool if that guy also happened to be as good as we all say he was. So we might be overhyping him based off of, you know, two really great seasons as a defensive coordinator. Again, one where the defense got better after he left and the Dolphins defense, by the way, also still good. Right. So um, he might just be better than Donatel, which I know a lot of people would be like, yeah, that's what we want. We just want that. We don't need a top five defense. But when you're talking about this guy, a lot of people are hyping up to the point where we're kind of hitting a territory. We got to be careful about our expectations, you know, about the personnel problems that'll make it difficult for him to produce a top level defense right away. Um, That sort of thing. And then also, I think the final reason it's both good and bad is that anything that gives Vikings fans hope is ultimately bad, right? Like that's yeah, fair. Yeah, it's just like the foundationally that we got to be worried about that. I mean, it as 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 evidenced by the entirety of last year. Yeah, right. I I, I suppose you're right. I I had said repeatedly that this is a team of destiny, and I meant it because destiny cuts both ways. Like this, this yeah, could right. be yeah. an amazing year. It could also be absolute terror. Yeah, the Greek fates were not known necessarily for their kindness. No, that is, <laughs> boy. If you, <laughs> <laughs> not even sure where to go with that now. So Flores is the Minnesota uh, candidate. He's 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 now going to be a member of the member of the staff. The rest of the league is playing a very. It seems like an extended game of. Who's going to be the head coach here? And who's going to be the defensive coordinator? Maybe they'll just end up getting an interview later. Like the league's coaching situation is taking a weird turn, I feel. And I'm not just saying this because Sean Payton decided apparently to take the Denver job in spite of Russell Wilson. Right. Yeah. I mean, um, he seemed to make it pretty clear that if Russell Wilson doesn't get on board, that's kind of it. And in fairness to Sean Payton, he has kind of the cachet to be able to do that, uh, which I don't think Nathaniel Hackett was going to win a war of politics against Russell Wilson. Um, but yeah, that one's pretty weird. We'll find it. You know, I guess maybe he does actually just believe that there's a way to to kind of recover it. I mean, the offense was a lot better after Hackett left, and that's crazy because the guy who replaced him, Jerry Rosberg, was not like an offensive play caller. He was just the game management specialist, I guess. And and the offense getting better as soon as Nathaniel Hackett leaves is just kind of like, oh, maybe there's something with this Russell Wilson guy. Maybe he's still got it. But yeah, that that one's crazy because like the Broncos I just have to give up a first round pick. They get to hire any coach they wanted. And they give up the they they give up a first round pick to get the one. Uh, that one's like kind of nuts. Uh, the uh, the Carolina Panthers going with Frank Reich. That one's also just kind of crazy. Not because Frank Reich doesn't deserve it or. Um, that, you know, he's not a compelling candidate, um, but because, A, they, like, hired Frank Reich's daughter in some capacity, like, four days before they hired Frank Reich, and that made Steve Wilkes, who was be- interviewing, and he was the interim head coach that went 6-6 under him, um, he was interviewing to be the head coach uh, with the Panthers, and he had a really good argument. Like, he um, produced the best offense the Panthers had seen, even though he's a defensive guy, produced the best offense that the Panthers had seen, despite the fact that they lost Christian McCaffrey. You know, he was able to get something out of Sam uh, Darnold. I mean, he had an argument to to take on that position. He's interviewing 
Frank Reich's daughter gets hired. And then four days later, Frank Reich gets hired. So Steve Wilkes thinks that he never had a shot. So he joins the Brian Flores. Speaking of Brian Flores, he joins the Brian Flores class action lawsuit against the NFL for uh, violating the terms of the CBA, which includes the Rooney Rule. Or not the CBA, but rather uh, violating the terms of the Rooney Rule, um, which, uh, you know, will go up in front of the either the national uh, relation uh, sorry the national labor relations board or the court it sounds like it's just going to the courts right um and so that that makes that crazy right that whole thing uh the cardinals uh, are taking forever to come up with a decision on a coach brian flores i believe was one of the candidates and he just decided screw it i'm just going to be a defensive i'm not going to wait you know uh this much time the cardinals say they're going to wait until after the super bowl to hire a guy which you know, I think we commended some teams last year for doing it, but here, I don't know. I, I don't know if it's fair, but it feels like it, they're, it's kind of like a fly by the seat of their pants sort of thing. Well, um, last year it was clear what Minnesota was going to do. So, like, they had to. They right, had to. Exactly. They, they weren't in a position where they could legally say, yes, Kevin O'Connell is going to be our coach. We had to wait until the end of the Super Bowl and then be able to say, yes, this is official. Come down to Minnesota. We'll call it good. This, I mean, the only reason why you do that is if your new head coach is going to is on the current coaching staff of one of the two teams in the Super Bowl. You'd hope, right? But I mean, like they they're still interviewing uh, Jiro Evero, right? And maybe that's why Brian Flores said, "Screw this! If you're going to wait, that tells me exactly, you know, what's on your you're waiting for Shane Steichen or whatever." Um, but like, th- I, that's interesting. And then the Colts, it it it. This is my read on the Colts. It very much seems well, like what the Colts he's, are doing. Uh, Evero, sorry, is is the defensive coordinator with the Panthers. With the Panthers. Yeah. Right, yeah, yeah, yeah. So then maybe that, that explains that too. Um, but like the Colts, it seems like someone is just trying to convince Jim Irsay not to hire Jeff Saturday. That's what is, and that's why they're taking so, like the yeah, They're waiting till like halftime. A, they're, they have to be waiting to halftime of the Super Bowl to do it. <laughs> yeah. The, the Cardinals are waiting because it seems like there's a like legal obligation for them to wait. The Colts are waiting because they're just trying not to hire a guy. They're trying their hardest not to hire a guy. Like You remember when, when he was hired and they had the presser during Monday Night Football? Like They tried oh to my God. Yeah. bury this. So yeah. I'm, I'm just saying halftime at the Super Bowl. Don't be surprised when Rihanna comes out and starts doing Umbrella. Yeah. <laughs> Rihanna announces it. Yeah, Rihanna's going to announce it right before Umbrella. It would be fantastic. Beautiful. Ella, Ella, Jeff, Saturday, Day, Day, Colts. It'll be great. <laughs> I'm sure she can do that on the fly. It'll be fine. Oh, yeah. Yeah, the coaching situation. That's talent's for. Yeah, like, <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's, it's for this. It's it's clearly for, for announcing head coaching hires from... Oh, from billionaires who should know better. Mm-hmm. I, I I still enjoy the fact that when he was hired, Ian Rappaport a- like sincerely asked Pat McAfee, "Did did you did you miss a phone call while we were talking?" I just I just want to <laughs> know if you had a possibility of being the head coach if you would have just not podcasted this morning. That was so funny, man. Just, did you check your missed calls? Man? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> just absolutely unreal well let's talk about the super bowl uh a bit because you are on location on assignment in uh in the glendale area how was so media day and all of that can you take us through what exactly is uh is going on for for media and exposure and interviews and and all that and why did a story about mac and cheese warm everyone's heart this week okay so uh, I'm, I'm going to start with that one. Credit to Charles McDonald. Um, just, <laughs> absolutely just went after it. So a couple of years ago, uh, Chuck uh, was at the Senior Bowl. Andy Reid's at the Senior Bowl. And um, this is even at the Senior It's at the airport on the way out of Mobile, if I remember the story correctly. And uh, and Chuck uh, approaches Andy Reid, which is, by the way, it's just totally normal for Chuck to do this. He'll just walk up to like a coach and be like, hey, I like this player. I like what he does. Do you want to talk about it? They'll talk. And then he exchanges numbers with them or whatever. Right. Um, He goes up to Andy Reed. They start talking and I guess they get on the topic of food and Andy Reed says, Oh man, you got to try my mac and cheese recipe. 
give me your number, I'll text it to you. So he texts Chuck the mac and cheese recipe. It's his, it's his seven cheese mac and cheese. He only sent six cheeses. And in the text, he says five will do. Uh, <laughs> and so I tell this story to my boss here, Adam Beasley. And Adam's like, well, we have a $200 grocery budget so that, you know, we don't waste all of our food at, at restaurants and takeout. So we're going to have to make some food for the first couple of days. Um, Cause you know, we have like a house that we're all staying in. And uh, do you, why don't we just make that? Do you want to just make that? I was like, yeah. So I looked up the recipe, uh, Arrowhead uh, pride, the SB nation site for uh, the Kansas city chiefs um, had posted a recipe based off of that uh, tweet from Chuck. Uh, and so I made that it was delicious. Uh, and we used six cheeses cause we didn't know what the seventh one was. Right. Um, and I actually, I was going to, uh, at media day, going to ask Andy Reid about it. I was like, Hey, here, we did it. But I'm so glad it was Chuck. Cause it was his text that set off the whole thing. And Chuck was like, Hey, I don't know if you remember, uh, I got your mac and cheese recipe, dude, you only sent me six cheeses. <laughs> I, I, what I love about that interaction is that he immediately knew who was, who, who he was talking to. So yeah. His you, face you, lit up by yep, the way. It's like, Oh, well. Yeah, but it looks like you haven't been exactly been eating a ton of it. Uh, you, you look pretty, you <laughs> yeah, look pretty right. good. Yeah, that was great. I'm glad that, that clip went around. Uh, Yahoo did a great job with it. They took that clip that Chuck had posted. Uh, Chuck works for Yahoo Sports and uh, had posted his tweet on top of it. Uh, Chuck was like, "Dream moment, you know this is this is what you work for." Yes, I loved it to man. go to go viral involving Andy Reid and mac and cheese again because he went viral the first time. It did right. To do it again, but with the Andy Reid interaction on yes. top of it, fantastic. That was that was great. So, as far as Media Day this year, in because you went to a little bit of Media Day stuff uh, in Minnesota, mm-hmm. a Media Day this year for or say Media Week really uh, for yeah. uh, for the Super Bowl in Arizona. How was how was that monstrosity uh, of a Monday night? It, that it seemed like there was a lot of things going on, and it didn't look necessarily to be at all friendly to like normal media. So, uh, okay. Yes and no. Um, so it seems very like chaotic and disorganized and it gives that feeling, but it's actually really hyper rigorously organized. Timings are really tight um, in terms of who's available, when they're available, when they have to leave and stuff like that. Uh, entrances and exits are like um, not, not rehearsed or choreographed, but really like tightly coordinated uh, and, uh, and and the players and the coaches and anybody of interest uh, leaves through like a separate tunnel. And so it's like, it's an interesting combination of that. And like a guy that's naked, except he's wearing a barrel with his radio station's name on it. Uh, somebody with a pin the tail on the donkey thing that they're asking players to play, you know, instead of asking the interviews, just have them like blindfolded and pin the tail on the donkey or, you know, asking them like weird questions and, you know, it's a much more informal media environment. So you're not necessarily asking like, hey, I noticed that, you know, Spagnola likes to play a lot of cover two. You're an offense that has the ability to rush with an extra player. How do you kind of take advantage of that? You know, he's not always going to do that. How do you respond to that? It's not like that. Although I did end up asking uh, the offensive coordinator that at media day, but it's like a lot of, you know, the, the food stuff with Chuck or some of the Kelsey brother stuff. That's kind of fun. It looks to me like and and correct me if if this is an inaccurate take but it looks to me like spring break for nfl writers uh yeah so like there is like a brand of nfl writer that will go a little hard and that's not the environment for that but for like the nerdy contingent or the blogger contingent of nfl writers again of which i very much identify with having been a member of um it, it kind of is, right? It's it's more family friendly than spring break, which is why I kind of isolate as kind of the more nerdy group. It would be their spring break. But like, yeah, I mean, it, it it's it's loose. It's casual. Uh, you get to see a bunch of people that you haven't seen in a long time or you only follow on Twitter. I like there's a bunch of people that I like introduced myself to and then they did a double take and they're like, oh, I follow you on Twitter, which is like always like a like a combination of horrifying and awesome moment, right? It's like, oh Christ, that that those are where my worst thoughts go. <laughs> <laughs> like, oh, you uh you follow me on Twitter or 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 more famously, 
Oh, hi, I'm Marie Fasson. Uh, oh, yeah, I block you on Twitter because of Case Cocos. <laughs> yeah. Um, actually, okay, here's a good one. Um, Tyler Dunn, you know, the guy uh, at Golong TD, uh, he has that sub stack, and he wrote that piece about the Bengals and how they feel disrespected. He wrote it was published um, about half a week, if not a week, before uh, their conference championship game against um, uh, against the Chiefs. Uh, and uh, I really I made fun of the fact that the Bengals – and the piece both seem to think that the Bengals were like disrespected, especially on defense, you know, and how the players feel disrespected. I made fun of it, and Tyler kind of and I went a little back and forth. And dude, Tyler's a great guy. We like, I saw him, and I was like, oh my god, Tyler Dunn, hey, what's up? Um, and we like we talked for a while as if like you know none of that had happened. And then he's like, hey, do you want to talk about the Bengals? <laughs> like, so actually, like he knew. well, yeah, right, yeah. And, and, and I was like, yeah, we could talk about it. It was great. Uh, but, you know, I told him I'd been following him for a long time, even when he was back at Bleach Report, wrote a really great piece. I forgot what it was about. I told him I think it was a Vikings piece, but I'd been following him since then. Um, I had subscribed to his Substack since before Bob McGinn was on. Like, I I, I, I like his work a lot. He does a really great job um, getting access and, and producing inside information um, from uh, that you wouldn't get otherwise. And the thing that's really cool is that he finds a way to get everybody on record. That's the thing that's really cool. Right. Like to get Patrick Peterson to talk about the problems with the way Zimmer coached, that's hard. It's so hard to get somebody on record, especially about somebody that they like and didn't have a problem with. Right. So he's good. So I don't want to like, but like, that's the kind of interaction I had a lot of where I was like, oh God, I, I called this dude the worst names on Twitter. I said he had the IQ of a soggy cardboard brick, man. There's no coming back from that. And he's like, a Reef, hey, what's going on? I brought the brick, you know, kind of that kind of thing. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I had a lot of fun. Uh, there's a there's like a, a Super Bowl media uh, dinner that um, I wasn't aware of. You know, my boss was like, hey, I, you know, I go here every year. I've been going 13 years. We got to go to this dinner. And I'm like, yeah, fine. Whatever. It's going to be like the stuffy banquet where I'm not going to see it. It's going to suck. We're going to be standing all the time. And they've got like wine and crackers. I'm not going to eat. I'm going to get hungry. And it's absolutely not that the Super Bowl host committee hosts it. And God knows they have too much money. Right. And so there are like all of these great little food stands. I had like this great. Now I'm just bragging. Right. But uh, <laughs> but they had like, you know, this great like the, the short rib, these s'mores. I love s'mores. Long time listeners know um, they had like a prickly pear cactus drink. Uh, they had like a bunch of different kind of food. So uh, it's been a ton of fun. It's my first experience here. I'm super proud. I'm super happy um, that I got here and I got to meet a bunch of people that I'd never met before, even at the at the combine. Um, that are unfortunately familiar with who I am and what I do. Like, oh, it's 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 turning into that meme about the reaping and the sowing. Yeah, right, exactly. It's like, Reef, if you just make fun of these NFL writers all the time, you'll get engagement on Twitter, but then they'll realize who you are. <sighs> yeah. I don't know if it's uh, if it's possible, but have has did Justice also make it there, or is he uh, is he not cool enough? I would have thought that the owners would have found a way to make it to the Super Bowl this week. I'm I'm sure if Justice wanted to, he'd be here. I'm sure he just blacked out and missed the deadline to apply for credentials. That sounds about right. To that, <laughs> boy, that's a great <laughs> callback, by the way. Not everybody's going to appreciate that. <laughs> I appreciate that. That's hilarious. All right, we're going to go to the mailbag. This isn't going to be the longest of episodes, but there's a bunch of Flores questions in this in the beginning, so we figure we'll be able to hit most of the Flores stuff here. Uh, we're going to start with uh, Kenneth Allen, who asks, assume for a moment there's a 75% chance Flores gets a HUD coaching job next year. Is it worth hiring for, more, for hiring him for one year, or would you rather hire a different, uh, different candidate so you're not switching coaches and potentially schemes three years in a row? And how much do you think this kind of reasoning should matter when hiring assistants? Do you think this actually gets taken into account by GMs and head coaches when they choose their top candidates? All right. So if there is a if, if Flores becomes a head coach next year, I think that there is probably uh, maybe an eighty five percent chance that he'd coordinated a really good defense. Like it's it's possible that he didn't coordinate a really good defense and still gets a head coaching job, and that all would kind of fit. It's not extremely rare, but I think it's really likely. Um, that he'd be good. So a 75% chance that he was good enough to become uh, a DC. So let's say 85% chance that uh, if he's a head coach, it's because he coordinated a good defense. So that's 0.85 times 0.75. That's about 64 or 65%. Um, so I have a guaranteed 
65%, which I guess is not guaranteed, but I can choose 65% chance this guy is a really good coordinator or a 50% chance he's above average. I, that I The numbers are kind of easy to me. I'd rather have the high likelihood that you get a good guy, even if it's only for one year. And there's multiple benefits to this, right? Because if you get a good defensive coordinator, he's going to be involved in your scouting process. So he's going to help you evaluate players. And it's somewhat likely that having a talented guy at that position is going to help you evaluate players better. So now you've got a draft class full of, and I, I'm assuming this is going to be a more defense-oriented draft class. You never got a draft class full of people that might have uh, a little bit more juice, that might have a higher probability of doing something for you, right? So you've got that chance. You've got somebody who has the ability to kind of help develop some of the other coaches on your roster. So maybe you don't like any of the defensive guys on your roster to ascend to the defensive coordinator level. They're not ready for it yet. Well, maybe under a year of somebody who's pretty good, um, they kind of see how that process should work. Um, in a more rigorous, coordinated, and structured way. And maybe you could say, hey, Toronto Jones, you've had a lot of experience with a lot of different coordinators. Now you get to experience this with um, you know, Brian Flores and uh, that kind of experience, your ability to work with all of these different kinds of defensive schemes um, like you have over the course of you know the, the couple of teams and the couple of head coaches and defensive coordinators that you worked with. Maybe that's given you the kind of experience that you need to ascend to that position, right? So uh, you have knock-on benefits, That'll help you, I think, not a ton, right? I don't think that like you're a year two or you're your N plus one after Brian Flores gets uh, hired to be a head coach is going to be astounding. It's not guaranteed. A bunch of people lose their defensive coordinators the next time around their defense isn't good. That's like known and accounted for in, in projecting defensive statistics. But I think your margins are a little bit better, right? So I don't think you're back down to Donatel levels as soon as he leaves. So I think it's likely that you've got essentially a 65, 70% chance you've got a really good guy year one and uh, maybe 55% chance year two and three are pretty good or a 50% chance things are all right for the next three years. I'm, you know, there's, there's something to be said about like reducing all of this stuff to numbers a little bit too often, but I, I think that that's probably what you want. You probably want to be in that better spot rather than commit to somebody that is a little bit of a toss up. Um, That and also, if the like, I, sometimes I say a lot. I, I, I just yelled at someone in a group chat for this um, because we were talking about Kirk Cousins, so of course. Um, but the goal is not to maximize your wins over a period of time. It's to maximize your chances of a ring. That's just how the NFL works. That's how fans work. Um, personally, I'd love to cover a Super Bowl of a team that I'm much more familiar with, right? Um, Despite being a part owner of the Chiefs. Right. I mean, now that I've got to experience this, I want to experience the other thing, you know, um, but uh, the um, the odds, I think, if you've got a really good defense, plus this offense, the odds of you being a chance to genuinely win a ring a lot higher. So, um, yeah, especially under the framework of uh, don't try to win games, try to win a ring under that framework. I think that that's yeah, this is where you want to be. Next question is going to be from Stizo, who asks, which defensive backs that have played for Flores should the Vikings target in free agency? Um, so there's, I mean, there's a couple, obviously, uh, because he was at Miami for three years, a number of the Miami uh, players that have experienced in a system would count. So Nick Needham, I think, would probably be a pretty decent slot option. He was pretty good for the Dolphins there. Um, Joan Williams, who's been... Uh, in a bunch of places, most recently with the Patriots, but he's been in a bunch of places. Justin Bethel was just with the Dolphins. Uh, but I think the 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 guy in the class that you want the most is probably Jonathan Jones. He not only played corner really well last year uh, for the Patriots in a style of a defense that is somewhat similar to what they'd run, he played really well um, for Brian Flores. That's when he really broke out. So, um, you know, he's a pretty good corner. I High level corner is probably the best way to put it. I wouldn't say elite, but a pretty high level corner would be nice to add him. That's maybe who you go after, but Nick Needham would be a great addition. You don't have to worry about Shannon Sullivan uh, as much, and you get to get somebody who knows the system well enough to kind of help teach it to other people. So I think that's probably the group of corners that that you're most likely to target. I wouldn't overthink that, right? I wouldn't say that you know they'd only go after guys that have worked with them before, but you know those are probably the guys to pay attention to. Uh, Nick Howard asks, for a Reefs drafting cornerbacks corner, how many corners do we draft in the upcoming draft? 
Uh, that's interesting because I think it's pretty obvious that they'll draft a corner. Um, how many is pretty tough. First, the Vikings don't have seven picks. I think they've got like five. They don't have very many picks, right? That can change. Obviously, Quasi could trade down. He can get a ton of picks. We've seen Rick do that time and again. Quasi's already, you know, showed an inclination to trade down. So I'm not saying it's impossible, right? But um, that's just one element, right? So one element is that currently the way the market is, they don't have any more picks. Not a huge, you know, barrier, but something to keep in mind. Second, um, there's a limit to kind of how much, unless you're apparently this year's Chiefs, there's a limit to how much you can get out of rookie corners in year one. I think that you want to bring in a veteran guy and you've got a bunch of young guys, right? You've got, aside from Cam Dancer, you've got uh, Andrew Booth and uh, a Caleb Evans. And so you have, a rookie, you have like a pair of rookies, a pair of second year guys, a guy that's about to hit his last contract. Um, and it's just a super inexperienced group being asked to run, frankly, what seems to be a pretty complex system. Um, again, you know, the chiefs, they've got Brian cook in the secondary. They've got, um, you know, Trent McDuffie, they've got Jalen Watson, they've got uh, Joshua Williams. Um, they've got a lot of players in that secondary that are rookies. So I'm not saying you can't produce an interesting defense without that, but, um, I think that they don't want to rely on just guys on the rookie contract. So I'm not going to say they're definitely going to get two, certainly going to get at least one. It would definitely not shock me if they got two, but it'd be kind of interesting to draft two corners one year and then the very next year also draft two corners that seems somewhat unlikely i'm not going to write it off but i wouldn't get my hopes up that it's just going to be you know round one cornerback round two cornerback round three cornerback round four center right like i think there's a chance they're gonna kind of move around in terms of whether they'll pick guys so i'm reminded uh since you mentioned that i'm reminded of the justice tweet from uh, from i believe last week or maybe earlier this week where he was asked what the Packers should do uh, with their draft. And he proceeded to draft, I believe, 10 quarterbacks in a row in this mock. <laughs> after trading Aaron Rodgers to the, I believe it was the Raiders, for every single one of their picks uh, for this year and next. <laughs> like 10 quarterbacks. And then like everything after that, he was getting like high grades, but there were a lot of Fs in there for the second <laughs> round. I think he said he had to stop because he ran out of quarterbacks that were listed. Yeah. Yeah, that sounds about right. Yeah. Also, just as a uh, as a heads up, Nick Howard wanted to say that uh, back in July he had he had approached us for baby names and I had uh, said that uh if you were not going to go with something from an Adam Sandler movie, which appears to be all the rage at this point, that uh, that you should go with I I believe my suggestion for a baby name was the the name of the bobsled in Cool Runnings. I which I don't remember exactly the name like Tallulah or something, but uh, did oh, have yeah, yeah, yeah. did have a did have a successful baby girl on the thirty first of January. Uh, unfortunately, did not go with our suggestion. So don't understand that it was perfect. That was I good. Remember. I thought that one was excellent. Uh, next kid, I think you have to name it uh, Robbie Hart. And uh, <laughs> we'll move on to Tim Rizzo, who asks, our main man Ziggy wears glasses often to improve his sight, as glass wearers do. Do you mm-hmm. think as it would be a, normal? Yeah, as, <laughs> as one does, as one must. Do you think it would be a good idea to de- introduce him to Mr. Beast to cure his vision problems <laughs> so you can see the roster clearly in the offseason to let Quasi tear it down? Man, did this cause discourse? Oh, man. I, I'm going to guess that uh, Mr. Wilf is familiar with the concept of like, what was it, a cataract surgery? I never watched the video. Um, but Basically, <laughs> uh, yes. Yeah. Uh, I, you know, that's probably not the issue for him. <laughs> no. But, you know, you, you can't. Yeah. Why, why, not, why not network Mr. Beast with like another billionaire, right? He, he just needs more in his pocket, right? I, that's, it, and, and plus, it, it'll get the views up, it'll get the clicks up. Right, which is we as we know, it's important because none of this charity could happen if you didn't do it all for the views. Yeah, like and subscribe now. <laughs> um, God, I feel dirty saying that. Loyal Stooge, which is a we we, we have a YouTube channel. We would like people to like and subscribe. That is accurate, but uh, James never wants to say it. So. No, I don't. I don't believe in it. It angers up the blood. <laughs> it emboldens. <laughs> it emboldens our enemies and weakens our allies. It's, it's that we, yeah we really need a coalition of the willing here <laughs> we do you don't 
You don't go to war with Luke Braun with the army you want. You go with the <laughs> army that you have. The Harby army. And boy, that is an outfit. <laughs> demoralized after a year, but they, they, they're still proud. Loyal Stooge asks, what happens with Mike Pettin? Do you expect him to depart the team? And what impact would his departure have? Um, I guess I don't expect that. Um, so because he's like a defensive kind of consultant, assistant and assistant head coach, he has a couple of roles. Um, he could leave, right? You know, he was interviewing for the defensive coordinator job, but I think that was like more perfunctory, right? Like you got to give, I don't think that he expected to get it, but you know, the Vikings wanted to know in case they couldn't go after, you know, their two uh, or three top candidates, right? Because they lost out on Ryan Nielsen. They lost out on Ashiro Evero who in fairness is like a late coming candidate into the process and they could have lost, uh, you know, Brian Flores to the Cardinals or something. Right. And so, you know, now you should probably have an understanding of your available options. So it was probably good to interview, but I don't think that this pushes him out necessarily. I don't think that the reason he was there is because he had this amazing relationship with Ed Donatel, right? I think it was because he had an opportunity to contribute to a team without being a defensive coordinator, which, you know, maybe he didn't want to be at the time. Um, and, uh, you know, he could leave. That wouldn't shock me, but him not leaving would not be, uh, you know, a huge, uh, shock to me either. Um, I think that he stays on, especially as the assistant head coach to kind of assist Kevin O'Connell and all of the kind of the day-to-day stuff that, you know, head coach might need. Um, what impact would his departure have? Obviously very difficult to tell. Um, sometimes I can, over the course of the research of trying to write some of these coaching profiles, um, I've kind of understood that very often it's really difficult to get an understanding of all of the impact that a position coach has or that a member of the defensive staff has or their input into the process. Um, So him leaving might mean that there is some knowledge lost on the ability to design particular types of blitzes, which Brian Flores might like to have access to, or kind of the ways that the combinations of certain coverages and fronts work together. Or maybe it's really important to have the knowledge of how Aaron Rodgers specifically plays inside the division if he decides to stay in the division. Um, or, you know, Mike Pettin has a history with all of these these Rams and Jets defenses that did a bunch of amoeba stuff that the Patriots kind of designed a lot of their stuff afterwards. Maybe that kind of having a, a through line of that knowledge will be really important to kind of helping design the looks and fronts that have confused a lot of defenses over time. So um, it, it might not even be that he's game planning. It might just be that he is a great person to bounce some of these ideas off of or ask some, you know, questions about, you know, hey, when you've got, you know, these crossers over the middle and you've got a linebacker that's not, you know, no longer has the athletic ability to kind of keep up with these crossers, what do you do? Well, you kind of, you collision them here, right? So um, those kinds of things are pretty useful to have just kind of generally really difficult to get an understanding of what that impact might be. Next question is going to be from Jack Rackham who asks, Arif, make the case for trading Justin Jefferson in the next two years instead of signing him to a record breaking extension. <laughs> I mean, the case, I hate it. I don't believe it. I think that they should sign up to a record breaking extension, but the case is probably something along the lines of, you know, if you look at it from a dollars by wins perspective, right? Wide receiver, of course, is one of the most valuable positions that you can have, right? It's basically right behind quarterback. It could, I think there's a good argument that it's actually ahead of offensive tackle. It's ahead of cornerback, that's for sure. Um, so wide receiver is one of the most important, if not the most not important non-quarterback position you can have in your roster, right? So I'm not, that's not the argument. The argument is if you take a look at it from a wins per dollar perspective, at the extremes, right? At your $30 million receivers, you know, 28, 29, 30, 31, um, the, every additional dollar you spend gets you less and less in terms of the amount of wins. So if you go from like a $4 million receiver to an $8 million a year receiver, you've improved your odds pretty substantially. If you go from 8 million to 12 million, you've not improved your odds by the same amount, right? If you go from 12 million to 16 million, you've not improved your, you've improved your odds even less, 16 to 20. And so each kind of step uh, decreases the amount of wins you get for a dollar spent. And so it's pretty inefficient to spend on the top of guys on the market, period. It just doesn't make sense to spend there. Um, plus the Vikings have a lot of talent that they need to distribute money around to. They have a lot of difficulty when it comes to clearing out the cap space they need in order to kind of fill out these role positions. We know that, you know, primarily these teams that are generally stars and clods, right, that they don't have any middle guys that are role players, 
we know that they don't do well, even in positions where um, it's not like a weakest link sort of thing, like defense at cornerback. It is, if you don't have a good wide receiver too, your wide receiver one is just not going to have a huge impact on the game. They might get 80, 1,800 yards, but they're not going to have enormous impact on the game, right? And so you need to fill out your role players and get stars. You can't just have stars and bad players, right? Because that's what the Rams are right now. They're stars and bad players. Last year when they won the Super Bowl, they had a bunch of really good role players that were you know, doing a great job either on the offensive line or uh, you know, that linebacker group in that secondary. They were pretty good. They, uh, the ones that weren't like Jalen Ramsey – and Aaron Donald, right? And Von Miller. Um, those other guys were pretty good. Now they're not so good. So you need to have with your stars, these role players and the Vikings don't have the ability to fill out that role player group because those marginal players in the Vikings roster are just not that good like they are in the Rams roster. So that'd be the argument is that you're not getting many dollars per win. You got to spend those dollars as efficiently as you can. And that's to get above average players in basically every position and then jump start where you are at wide receiver, at quarterback, at cornerback. You know, that's, um, kind of how you would do it. So that's probably the best argument for it. It's bad, but there it is. It it exists in the ether, and we yeah. all just know that it's terrible. Uh, <laughs> Jack asks, what's the likelihood we find a good suitor for Cook? In lights of reports that he won't take a pay cut, which is valid, uh, will the Vikings be at a disadvantage trying to move him when teams can wait for him to be cut? Is there a realistic world where we just keep Cook? Yeah, it's it's tough for me to imagine that they just kind of outright cut him. I mean, it the money situation is not good for the Vikings with regards to Cook. Um, but I can see him getting something similar in free agency. So why would he, uh, especially if he was cut, so why would he uh, decide to just take a pay cut to take a pay cut, right, if he's going to get that money kind of regardless? So I get it. Um, but it's tough if he refuses to take a pay cut that the Vi- the idea that the Vikings would just decide, okay, well, we're playing hardball, bye. That that seems unlikely to me. But if it if it is, then obviously teams wouldn't want to necessarily trade for him. The only reason you trade for him is basically to get the right of first refusal, first mover advantage, that kind of thing, which is not the same as trading for somebody because you think they're talented, they're going to add to your team, and it's worth that um, amount, right? Because Cook is not going to be worth the amount if he gets cut. Um, because he could be had for essentially free. All you have to do is compete. So you just take the competition out. That's the discount. And so the I don't want to negotiate with a, a player versus other teams, that cost is probably a fifth round pick, whereas the quality of player that Cook is might be a second or a third round pick, maybe a third. Um, so th- th- that's the difference there. I, I just don't know that it's there. It is, I guess it's not an amazing running back class from what I'm seeing, but it's not a bad one. But at the same um, time that he would potentially be cut, you're also looking at Ezekiel Elliott's situation in Dallas. And it appears the two of right. them have a very similar situation going. Right. And, I mean, Tony Pollard's hitting free agency, right? Like, I just don't know, like, given how difficult it is for veteran running backs to produce. And again, we're seeing... You know, Nick Chubb, Christian McCaffrey, they produced in a big way. But on the other hand, Derrick Henry didn't. And it's like, and Christian McCaffrey, it's just like, well, over the lifetime of his second contract, he's not been worth it. He's been really great for the 49ers this year. But over the lifetime of his second contract, he's not been worth it. Same with Ezekiel Elliott, right? Same with Derrick Henry, if he continues to perform at this pace, right? And so you take a look at those examples, you get Delvin Cook, and then you're like, I could have him, or I could have like Bijan Robinson. Like, I, I think I know which one I would take. Right, it's not because I know Bijan Robinson's better. He might not be, but I know he costs rookie contract money. So uh, it's tough for me to think that he has a suitor. It's tough for me to think that the Vikings would cut him. Those kind of run at odds to each other. But because um, I mean, if the one team values him, why would another team value him? But um, I, I would imagine that it would be at his contract. Getting more than a third would would surprise me. And I feel like the running backs really should just go to the script writer and immediately start complaining. Right. Yeah. I mean, they've been, they've been shafted by the script writer since 2005, honestly. Yeah. So, well, since probably since Arian Foster was in the league, now that we're, <laughs> yeah. now that we're looking at this, now that we have a patient zero to, to point to, mm-hmm. uh, beef Brewski asks, trying to wrap my head around zone and man coverage. Why are some players better at one and not the other? Patrick Peterson was good at man coverage, but said a switch to zone might be better since he was getting older. Is zone coverage easier? 
Uh, I wouldn't say one is easier or worse. I think there was this perception that man coverage is more difficult. And I think that the raw athletic talent it takes to be a good man coverage corner, that kind of exceeds to some extent what you need to be a zone corner, which I think is what Pe- Peterson's getting at, uh, is that you need to be able to run at any speed to be a man corner. And you need to have um, like the flexibility, the lateral agility, all that to be a man corner. To be a zone corner, you have to still have a level of athletic talent. I think click and close, for example, is just a really important skill to have. But your ability to execute a speed turn is not as important. Your ability to recover is not as important. You need to anticipate a lot more. You need to read route coverages a lot more. Um, You need to play with a level of instinctiveness for how an offense is developing in a way that, and you need to be instinctive in man coverage, but in a way that's not quite as true for man coverage. You still need to pay attention to what techniques wide receivers want to use, what techniques they'll use to get into certain routes. That's all important. But in zone, uh, there is a lot more reading and reacting and a lot more delicacy with which you can kind of execute your techniques and concepts. Because if you're six inches off, that means now you're susceptible to a double move because you've given up too much leverage to the outside, right? Whereas in man coverage, you can kind of out-athlete it, but now your other zone guy who's in his landmark is now not in the position that he needs to be in in order to cover up for your mistake, right? So um, there are still technical errors that can blow up in man coverage, but it seems like the margin for error on your technique and your ability to read is different. Plus there is a different physical skill set, right? Like I think pure acceleration burst in the first 10 yards matters a little bit more at zone, whereas long speed matters a little bit more in man coverage. Like you still need certain athletic uh, traits that you're just not going to get for the other one. Um, But I wouldn't say one is necessarily easier than the other, Um, especially because um, in zone coverage, the quarterback can manipulate you a lot more. And it's just, you're playing a different kind of game. Whereas against a receiver, that kind of manipulation is a little bit different. And I think with Patrick Peterson, given the experience that he has and the history of the game that he's played, that he can fall back on um, zone coverage wouldn't be, as big a challenge for him as it would be for a new zone corner uh, in terms of kind of figuring out kind of the mental um, traits required to execute it well. But his athletic talent doesn't allow him to be as effective as a man coverage corner. So it's not that one's easier than another. It's that his skill set has transitioned to being ideal for one to being ideal for another. Alex asks, maybe this is too much to ask, but how high would you be willing to draft each position, assuming that a fairly normal need when there aren't stud quarterbacks or elite players falling really far? Are there any positions you would feel the need to be or definitely shouldn't be top round picks? It feels like a linebacker would be a waste as a first, but and we have tackles, but nearly every other position feels like it could warrant a first round pick if the right guy is there. So, so presumably this means like for the Vikings. Yeah. Um, yeah, so I mean, I would definitely be willing to draft, obviously, a cornerback in the first round. A center, I'm not sure. I've been mocking uh, John Michael Schmitz to the Vikings every so often. As a center, he's a first round center. The Vikings need a center. Um, but for the most part, our understanding of the position, which I think at center is more difficult to evaluate than almost any other position that we have data for. Um, but still, it seems like the data suggests that centers are just not first round players. And this is an area where actually analytics in the NFL kind of seem to align because centers are very rarely picked in the first round. They have the lowest salary out of all of the offensive linemen. Um, The NFL has historically not valued centers. And so for the data to kind of come into the same side of that, that tells me that it's probably not the case that you want a first round center. So that's probably one that you would avoid. Uh, I think guard is probably the same way. Um, But yeah, obviously you corner. I think a linebacker is probably a waste. It really depends because if Brian Flores thinks he sees like a Donta Hightower type, well, that's not a regular linebacker, not because Donta Hightower is talented, although he is, but because the role that he plays is more valuable than that of a traditional linebacker in kind of the same way that Anthony Barr played a, a more valuable role than a traditional linebacker. So there are some situations where a linebacker in the first makes sense, but otherwise, no. Um, safety, I'd say no, I, I think for fairly obvious reasons, um, wide receiver, I think it totally makes sense to draft a first round guy. Um, not running back obviously, but that's about, I, I guess, yeah, I would still get a quarterback just because good to have that. Um, but yeah, for the most part, I think I would probably stick to cornerback situationally, some linebacker, 
Um, situationally, some defensive tackle, if you wanted to replicate what Philly does defensively, uh, I'd say an edge rusher is fine to draft in the first round. Um, it wouldn't be ideal, but I think it's fine um, just because of how valuable those are and you're not going to get to Darius forever. Um, and then a wide receiver. So I think those are the positions. So the other positions I'd probably say no to, um, but I also am not like super cognizant of the talent distribution throughout the draft yet. The next question is going to be from Ingram's left foot who asks, follow up to the relationship slash playoff corner. I took your advice and didn't watch the championship round during my wedding slash honeymoon weekend. So what do we think of the Vikings chances this weekend? The fantastic. They're going to kill it. Yeah. Uh, given the murderer's row of the quarterback schedule next year, what type of punishment do you expect to be doled onto the Vikings if they replay the 2022 quarterback voodoo card? Uh, all unrelated, Spanish replays of old 49ers-Eagles games are really hard to follow. You don't say. The uh, So what type of punishment do you think the Vikings would uh, receive for trying the trying the backup quarterback thing again this year yeah so um well first to kind of clarify the murderers row they'll be playing the chiefs and the Chargers uh next year uh at home uh if you're worried about justin fuels they'll be playing him if you're worried about uh jordan love or i guess aaron Rodgers, they'll be playing him jared goff obviously um the 49ers who don't have a quarterback as far as we know uh, <laughs> um uh and uh the saints who don't have a quarterback and on the road, they'll play the Broncos and the Raiders. We don't know what that quarterback situation is going to be. Either Russell Wilson is going to be good or bad. We don't know who the quarterback of the Raiders is going to be. Falcons, same thing. Panthers, same thing. But they'll be playing Jalen Hurts on the road as well. So there are going to be some pretty good quarterbacks. I wouldn't say necessarily it's the worst quarterback schedule in the world. But if they play like a Gardner Minshew and a Chad Henney, and I don't know who's behind Justin Herbert. I don't even know if those two are under contract for their respective teams. But yeah. Um, if they're in that situation, I think the karmic punishment is that the Vikings make it to the conference championship game. I was going to say either that or Kirk finally gets hurt. Oh, geez. Wow. That is a, that's a karmically appropriate punishment. That's the sort of thing that, that claps back at you. Yeah. Uh, Raul asks two questions. First, for the Jesus and Harry Potter corner, which player mm. that died for the sins of Donatel will rise again under Flores? <laughs> When I saw this question, I was like, oh, God, it's more Hogwarts legacy stuff because my timeline is like full of people arguing about it. Um, it's super cool. I'm like trying to like follow like Super Bowl news. and It's like, yeah, this game sucks anyway. It doesn't even matter if it's transphobic. And it's like, I, that's a weird sentence. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> You're like, that's, cool story, bro. That, I'm trying to find out what uh, what could Goodell meant when he said that he thought that officiating has never been better. Cause I can think of one game in particular against Washington, the Vikings really should have been able to do something about. Right. Yeah. Um, or somehow the Vikings has come back against the Colts should have been even more, uh, impressive. Yeah. Right. With two scores. They going right. So, um, yeah. <laughs> what player, uh, will, uh, who, who played poorly, I guess, under Donatel will play well under Flores. I think 100% Eric Hendricks. That that to me just seems like a natural answer. Um, not only is uh, is Flores a former linebackers coach and also a linebackers coach kinda with um, with the Steelers. That's less important to me. More that Flores seems to always play in a way or coordinate in a way that allows the players to play fast. That was the issue with Kendricks. It seemed like he didn't know what was being asked of him from play to play. But I think he's still fundamentally talented. So that's my pick, Eric Hendricks. Uh, number two, what are your thoughts on quarterback independent salary cap to level the playing field? It seems like drafting a good quarterback is more luck than skill, but a cheap quarterback ren uh, renders too huge of an advantage. So so my understanding is that that would mean that quarterbacks are uncapped, right? Um, unless you implement a max contract style thing on top of a salary cap. So you say, hey, your salary cap next year is $200 million dollars. Your quarterback cap next year is $40 million. The answer to that, of course, is that every quarterback is going to max that out because it turns out uh, NFL teams are not actually as cash poor as they pretend to be. Um, I mean, there Except are the cash Raiders. flow problems. Yeah. yeah, I was about to say the Raiders and the Bengals do have cash flow problems, but you still can get a $40 million contract taken care of if there's a max. Uh, the only way to suppress quarterback wages is to tie it to the wages of everybody else and say, hey, 
you know, if we hit this cap, we can't pay other people. So um, that puts negotiated pressure on us. It also puts pressure on you to, you know, not take so much money so that we can win. Um, so th- it creates kind of a problem where if you do that, either quarterback salaries have to be uncapped or they're at a cap and everybody hits that cap because it doesn't matter. Um, but I mean, my thoughts are we should just get rid of the salary cap. <laughs> That's my thought. Uh, you know, uh, great. The Dallas Cowboys now get to feel the greatest team ever because Jerry Jones has more money than all of them. Fine. The players win. Um, and, uh, and historically uncapped leagues don't actually seem as dominant. Um, unless you, you have like a very weird problem, like the, what was it the, the 1920s Yankees? That's an issue. But, um, for the most part, it's not as bad as people say, uh, at least historically. Um, and there's still a revenue sharing process in place. So it's not the same as the premiership, right? So I would say get rid of the salary cap. I think that that's best because the players, you know, deserve it. But on top of that, I, I don't know that that really levels the playing field too much. It just makes situations a little bit weirder. That's all. Well, let's go to our next question, which is, uh, an important one that, that definitely spurred a lot of conversation. A second jet has hit Drew Bledsoe asks for a reefs podium corner. What is the, what is the difference between a podium and a lectern when it comes to public speaking? Okay. So first of all, language is a living and breathing document, right? Language updates because dictionaries are not, uh, prescriptive, they're descriptive. All they do is really kind of tell us what the common parlance is. And so in that context, uh, lecterns are podiums. Not all podiums are lecterns, right? There's still other usages of podium, but all lecterns are podiums in the way that we use the word podium. Everyone kind of understands the meaning of podium, right? So that that's one thing. But also... Uh, from a kind of narrower interpretation that's a little bit more prescriptivist, uh, which again, language experts generally are descriptivist. They very rarely are prescriptive. Um, in that sense, elect, the, the lectern is the stand that uh, you know contains the, the microphone, has a little uh, platform to put documents or your speech on that people uh, stand behind when they give their speech. A podium is a raised or elevated platform. A dais, for example, is a version of a podium that is traditionally smaller and circular, although that definition has expanded as well. But a podium is a platform. Of course, because of the nature of Super Bowl pressers, all the lecterns are on a podium, and then the people who are speaking behind the lectern have to be at the podium in order to do that. So in a sense... Still at a podium. So why is this relevant, Arif? I don't know. Oh, it has nothing to do with uh, <laughs> with someone trying to correct you on Twitter and it turning out okay, to be a real so, person. So okay, look, look. First of all, that we don't know that second thing. There's a Twitter account, I believe it's just at not a lectern, who corrected me when I said Andy Reid was at the podium, uh, and said. Uh, not a podium that's a lectern. I quote tweeted him with something that I think would change our iTunes explicit rating, if I remember correctly. Yes. Uh, but I functionally said, that's nice. I think that captures the spirit of what I said, right? Yeah. Yeah, I, that's nice. Uh, and I thought it was a bot, and so I didn't expect them to respond, and they responded contextually i guess you could do anything with chat gpt right but they responded contextually and i was like oh god this is a person ah great but then i thought i was like oh great i'm fighting with a real person that sucks and then i realized no they devote their time to this thing i i'm good actually <laughs> this is I'm the hill you. this is the hill they repeatedly die on yeah we're good here <laughs> so yeah and then uh i always like one of my I don't know, failings? Sure, let's go with that. Uh, is that I always forget that my bosses like read my tweets. Not like happen to read my tweets, but like over the course of their workday, their job includes reading my tweets. Um, and so they go out to see what I tweet. And I, I, just, I just forget that, uh, which seems unwise. 
Um, have, how many and, times have they asked about you and Luke Braun's interactions? None, because I brought that up in my interview with them. <laughs> Wait, that came up in your interview with Pro Football Network? Listen. I brought it up. No, I, I know. Like, that, that's, hey, you, you personally brought it up. I, I, I need you to know that when I do this, I'm probably not a legal liability. <laughs> So when I say that I'm waiting outside of Luke Braun's house <laughs> with a knife, just know that I'm safely at home and in Minnesota or hiding in Canada. Right. And the knife is to offer to carve uh, his roast beef, right? It's, it's, it's all pleasant and we're friends here. Um, yeah. Yeah. Well, speaking, <laughs> speaking of friendly and Canada, let's go to Nolan Kaler who asks for North Code – which Juno Award is Melissa most likely to win? And what's the over-under uh, on uh, if she will join Nickelback on stage for their induction into the Canadian Music Hall of Fame? Okay, so I knew that she was up for a Juno Award because I asked James, what's a Juno Award? And, <laughs> and the only reason why I know is because back when we were kids and the over-the-air thing would pick up the Canadian Broadcasting Channel... I would mm. see ads every once in a while for the Juno Awards. <laughs> yeah, I thought Canadian when I Grammys. First, I thought it was like, oh, Canada really likes the Elliot Page film Juno, <laughs> and so You're like not not quite no. It, there's just awards for the like the most twee artist, the wow. most likely to kind of annoy you because they're Michael Sarah ish. Okay, well, that actually does. <laughs> yeah, now that I'm thinking about that, that's. See, it makes sense. Um, so she's been nominated for essentially every category um, that she could be qualified for. So uh, artist of the year, album of the year, single of the year, pop artist of the year, um, you know, fraud of the year, all of the things that are true um that uh that she qualifies for yes uh and melissa in this case being the impersonator that has right. been pretending to be so I, I always forget that you, every episode has a potential new listener and we need to at least pretend to catch them up on the lore um we, again not our lore it's been established at this point um i hate that this actually applies but long time listeners yeah actually long time listeners no <laughs> Uh, we didn't come up with this fact. We didn't do the initial investigation into the fact that uh, Avril Lavigne has long since passed away and has been replaced by an impersonator named Melissa. Um, anyway, Melissa the Fraud is probably going to win pop music artists. It was probably going to win all of them. Um, but I'm guessing is going to win uh, is specifically pop uh, music album of the year, I think is the specific uh, genre specific one. Um, so, and the odds of yeah. her joining Nickelback on stage seem incredibly low. I thought she was romantically linked to Chad Kroger for a while. So why would she go and join him on stage? Right. She's to maintain the fiction that she and Avril are the same. They need to maintain the awkwardness of that particular interaction. So yeah. you wouldn't want them on stage at the same time. Uh, let's go to Joey who asks, given Jared Allen's recent win over Olympic gold medalist, John Schuster in curling, what other drinking activity turned Olympic sport should he conquer next? Okay, so I have long been interested in this. Because <laughs> um, when Vernon Davis was curling, I was like, I actually am interested in... First of all, I like curling a lot. Second, Vernon Davis curling was really interesting. Third, Jared Allen being like really gung-ho about curling, also crazy interesting. So um, Jared Allen is a super serious curler right now. Like he didn't just happen to beat John Schuster at like a random thing. Uh, you know, no, uh, he, he called team. his shot and he, he did it. It took years of practice, but he did it. Yes. And the so maniacs did it, put him in the hall of fame. <laughs> yeah. But so he's currently on um, Jason Smith's team. So Jason Smith was the American re or was the skipper of the American uh, representative team for curling back in 2010. And Jason Smith has been on a tear the last couple of years. It has been, it's really difficult to make his team to be worth being on his group of four. Like you have to be Olympic level. Cause that's his only goal, right? Is to 
get beat John Schuster and make it back into the Olympics. And so um, the fact and, and Schuster's team is just uh, in the United States magnificent. It doesn't compare to Canadians that are on a crazy level, but um, uh, Schuster has like won the last nationals um, uh, 11 to or won the last nationals in 2020, 11 to zero, won the Olympic trials, 11 to two, very difficult to beat. But right now in the Pomeroy rankings, um, Jason Smith's team, which includes Jared Allen is uh fifth, right. And Schuster's a second, like they're really competitive. So that's pretty meaningful. Also what, um, what gate, what, uh, Drinking activity to an Olympic sport should he conquer next? Um, feather bowling. I did that over at Prize Brewing um, over by the Minnesota Bouldering Project recently. And it rules. And because I'm good at it, I think it should be an Olympic sport. And because it involves a bit more of an extreme thing, uh, despite the fact that he's, he's famously sober, uh, I feel like he should bring back 80s lawn darts. Mm-hmm. and uh and just become the the world's biggest expert on that that would rule yeah uh logan uh, bullshit they, sell, they don't sell lawn darts anymore right no like, you do not... have to find them <laughs> 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 the same the same corners that you can find public assistance you can likely find uh some 80s, oh yeah okay yeah some some 80s <laughs> lawn darts uh logan bullsharif asks for James and Arif's grifter corner, what podcaster grift item are you most likely to sell? Supplements, MLM scheme, trafficking people in Romania, fake university, or other? And what would the brand name of the grift be? All right, so we got the Joe Rogan, we got the Drew Brees, we got the Andrew Tate, we've got the Trump University or other, um, which uh, let's let's call that one Mr. Beast. No, uh, let's call that one. <laughs> It's it's Norse burger is what it is. It's Norse burger. <laughs> yeah, we're, yeah, we're gonna open up um, that over in a, in a ghost kitchen near you. Yeah, yeah, Norse burger <laughs> ghost kitchens with one location in Mall of America for no yeah. discernible reason. Um, what what grift item would we sell? Um, I think so. First, I think that there's probably something unique. Uh, you know, the socks, for example, I think are a great. I mean, buy the socks. Um. But the uh, the supplements are probably the closest, but I can't think of something that'd be kind of uniquely ours. That'd be a great part of a grift because I just I don't think our listeners are social enough to do the MLM stuff because you do have to talk to other people and sell them on the scheme, and they have to talk to other people. Uh, and it's like once you convince your D and D party, who are they going to talk to? Right? Well, so that's I mean, tough. a lot of people have said over the years that they were introduced to Norse code from a friend. Right, so, they're all in the same D and D party. The, yeah. My issue is the downstream <laughs> is is beyond that social group. I I'm amazed that you don't see the potential for the item uh, in front of us. Uh, we have to go with the body pillow. The body pillow. No, okay. I knew. Is... I knew. I knew that. It, that's why I cut myself off from the merch store. I so I stopped talking <laughs> about it because I knew if I went down that direction, it'd be like a reef. The body, and no, that's nope. First of all, dear God, I hope that's a grift because that means we're not actually pushing body pillows out the door. Well, but I mean, I'm, I'm worried that I like look. Let's let's talk about the supplements. For what about break? Can we do brain force? No, I think that uh, we can't do anything involving on it. We would definitely want to do something like something like a nice public facing body pillow like body pillow that's is not ah. boy I, if there was only okay, a so, way so a fake football university got it. a fake football we teach people how to watch football we charge that's them nice. like uh uh eight hundred dollars and then well so first we charge them 60 uh they put in their parents credit card for 60 you know if we then, go to amazon and we collect the money first and we, we give them like the 10 lessons that are like a minute long and kind of unsatisfying. It's actually, and so you say, hey, if you idea. want the real school, if you want to be part of like the elite get football watchers Walmart, club, Walmart, get like uh, cheaper just press this pillow. button, we'll charge you $800 to get the so real We're not looking videos. for quality here. We're looking for grift. All right, we'll, we'll figure something out. We'll, we'll, we'll talk about this after the show and, and figure something out after. Uh, for James and Arif's parenting corner, how do I convince my two-year-old he needs to stop covering his eyes when running around so that he'll uh, stop running into door frames? 
Additionally, even though we're not Eastern European gangsters, are we allowed to have matching family tracksuits? Okay, I I feel like the the clarifying that you're not, um, I'm worried a little bit. I do understand the tracksuits thing kind of evokes that, um, but uh, I this is a real royal tenenbaum situation. I is even with the two year old, right? That's this is a lot going on here. Uh, first of all, it sounds like uh, the door frames are not teaching the two year old this lesson, right? That's what it sounds like. Uh, I don't know that you could be more convincing than a door frame. I think this one had this, this is a time issue. Yeah, I think that uh, over time the child will just learn, and the the door frames will do the job for you. Right. Yeah. I, that that to me seems you can't. I it's hard for me to imagine you being more persuasive than the door frame is. That's I. That's it. Uh, second, <laughs> <laughs> um, that's not an insult to you. I don't think I could beat a door frame in a debate. Like that's. Running into a door frame that teaches you a lesson real fast, I assume. Um, so, yeah, that's you know, uh, but the tracksuit thing, I think, I think the less stylish the tracksuit, the more Eastern European gangster you look. Which then that kind of circles back around, kind of horseshoe. Now it's really cool looking again. But I think, I think if it is kind of well-maintained enough, sharp enough, kind of fashionable enough, you're fine. Adidas uh, enough. Say, Adidas enough. Yeah, Adidas enough. I, I would say that probably don't make it like the thing for your family. Like don't, like you don't all go grocery shopping in them, right? Like you show up to the park and be obnoxious. That's that's what you do with that. Yeah. Uh, let's go to Bolshery Floyd. Who asked? Is still do- Why are they still doing this bit? <laughs> They're still part of the Bolsharif revolution on the uh, on the Discord. For a reef, separation makes the heart grow fonder. Corner. While away for multiple weeks, did you begin to miss answering Norse code mailbag questions? If so, do you now have an appreciation for dare I say questions about magic, or is the opposite true? Did you feel a sense of relief being away for so long? Also, is there any specific uh, player that you could see Flores wanting to bring to Minnesota? Eric Rowe, perhaps. I, okay. It's, okay. So first of all, no, I I don't have. Okay. So the fact that our rule is that you can't ask about magic doesn't apply to asking about asking about magic. Yeah. It's That's just, dumb, James. It's, it's a meta thing. I'm sorry. We can't, we don't, we made the, we can, we can enforce the rule however we want. We don't have to follow the letter of the law, this one. Okay. We just not make it a question. Oh, now I'm supposed to like, okay. <laughs> I just, I just make, it's a magic question. That's all I'm saying. I am so, going to make so many body pillows. <laughs> Wait, like you personally? <laughs> and sell them, yes. Yeah, I'm. That's worrisome on its own. All right, so, uh, I look, we did not want to record. It just, we explained it at the top of the show. It's a circumstance, right? Um, is there any specific player I could see Flores wanting to bring? Eric Rowe makes a lot of sense. I did mention a couple of the cornerbacks. I think that you do want someone in the secondary though specifically. And I think it's probably a cornerback. So Eric Rowe would make a little bit of sense because he's a tight end matchup. He's played both cornerback and safety, which is what he's projected as coming out of the draft. He's a super athlete. Um, didn't, I think, um, get a ton done, but he had a couple of years, especially with new England where he was pretty good. Um, I know he was also on the Eagles for a little bit of time too, but that would, I would, that would make sense to me, but I think, um, you know, Jonathan Jones would be uh, ideal. I did answer a couple of questions in the, uh, on the discord specifically. Uh, and you were answering Don from Ohio's thing earlier without, uh, uh, without us recording. So, uh, I did, somebody had asked, I was, I was wondering if you wanted me to rehash that. No, that's <laughs> he's, he's on his own. He's, he's on a thing right now. Uh, there was a question in the relationship advice section, which I have told my friends who are very aware of, of all of the fun I've had over my, uh, adult life in relationships and the mm-hmm. fact that I have a relationship corner astounds them, but they, um, <laughs> I, I, I don't, I don't see what's so weird about that. I have a parenting corner. That's well, yes, it's, it goes hand in, well, it goes hand in hand in the, in the wrong sort of way, but I, <laughs> I, there was a question in the discord about, uh, you know, there's, there's this couple that's clearly on a first date. How could I like make it better for them? And my response was to, uh, was to attack the, uh, was it was to attack the server so that way like the the couple has something to like talk about for the rest of the date they can like trauma bond for at least the next six months out of it 
I was like, yeah, I, I'm clearly losing it. I clearly need to record and get uh, these sort of like things on paper. Well, ET space on, on response is pretty good. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, yeah, this is this is just where we're going with this. I mean, if you can't do this for love, I and mean, what what's what's the point? Just make sure you're not doing this at a Waffle House. Uh, also, for Arif's glory days peaked in college debate corner. Okay. I remember Arif saying in the past that he doesn't believe we are living in a simulation. What is his argument to prove that we are not living in a situation? Uh, there, there is like a really good set of like uh, syllogisms and base deductive reasoning that kind of works your way out of the simulation one. Um, but it like, and it's compelling to me. But it is not so important to me that I remembered it. So I have forgotten it. Um, I do know it exists. I've seen it. Um, I don't know if it's like philosophically rigorous or anything like that. Not that important to me for this reason. To, I, why does it matter? It, it doesn't, I don't care. Um, I don't believe we're living in a simulation, but it is not functionally information that would change the way that I act. So I'm not going to act as if it's true um, because uh, the very same people that would uh, make arguments that uh, we are living in a simulation or that there is a possibility to create a simulation are the people that also make the argument that there is no distinction in reality between um, a sufficiently advanced AI's feelings and feelings, right? Which is why like um, Rocco's basilisk, basilisk relies on the premise where uh, an AI will, uh, t- spoilers for Rocco's Basilisk, if you hear this argument, you're doomed. I think is the problem, but um, in a, in AI is has leverage over you by being able to create an identical person to you uh, in memories and feelings and torture you. And one of the problems that you have to solve philosophically is how is that person distinct? And it's a bunch of just clever arguments that don't they don't craft kind of the essence, right? There's no like. Continu- uh, continuation of consciousness that matters to them. Those are the same people that argue that that's functionally the same, right? And I think that the base assumptions behind both things would require them to be the same. And so if we accept those, then there is no difference between how you act in quote unquote, the real world and the simulation. So it's not an important distinction to me. I don't care if we're living in a simulation. I think there's a pretty good argument out there that I've seen that we're not, but also who cares? I mean, I care. Why? Because I'm convinced I don't have the high score. <laughs> it's, a, it's a simulation, not a game. There's a difference. Uh, maybe. Uh, how, do you, how do you score points in Microsoft Flight Simulator? Uh, by having a perfect landing. <laughs> I, I, don't, I don't know how to tell you this, and I can tell you, I have, do not have a perfect landing. Uh, Tank B. Sharif asks, for James's relationship corner, my six-year-old recently came to me for advice over the crush she has on a classmate. Rather than laughing it off or playing the typical chest-beating dad card, I asked her to talk about her feelings and told her I needed to consider, uh, to consider things for a bit. What advice should I give her? How should I prepare her for the mental anguish of rejection or even the risk of rejection? Why do I immediately picture the gif of Matt Damon aging and saving, and saving Private Ryan as she spoke to me? Okay, a lot going on here at once. Uh, one, kind of disrespectful to your daughter that you would ask us for advice. Not because it's you know your business or her business or uh, just because I feel like if you liked someone, you wouldn't ask us to mend your relationship with them. Uh, I disagree. They're going to the, they're going right to the source. Uh, second, uh, I think it is very cool that your initial reaction was to, uh, ask her to talk about her feelings and open up and, and, and be a place, uh, of, of, uh, non judgment that she can kind of disclose anything that's happening in her life to you. Uh, that's cool. That sounds like one of those things that, you know, if I was like, hey, this is kind of an ideal parent, and then a real parent would tell me, that's not realistic, you idiot. That's not how it works. So kind of cool that 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 does work. Uh, third thing, I think I'm a three, right? Um, okay, so rejection, I just feel like it's obviously because uh, it's a kid, you have the ability to kind of frame how that works. But I just don't know 
that you can ever get. It's a very human thing to not want to be rejected, even non-romantically, but romantically, um, especially obviously when you're a teenager um, and you're experiencing a lot of stuff for the first time. But like, it's the end of the world sometimes, right? So I get it. But to me, I think that the ways that have kind of helped, uh, like when I'm coaching kids and they ask me, kind of helped a little bit is just to say, look, the kind of person that doesn't value a relationship with you is probably not the kind of person that you want to be with. Every no is a gift because it allows you to kind of move on a little bit faster and find somebody who works better for you. Uh, your daughter's six. I have no idea how well she'll understand that, but that's because I don't know how kids work. That's the point of this corner. Um, is, is, can they speak English at six, That right? Like that, she could have yes. told you if she didn't. There's no way she could have told you that without her being able to talk to you. That Okay, that makes sense. So- yeah, I, I would just I would I would pick up an encyclopedia and give it to her. I, that's like got to be the same thing. No, 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 it is not. <laughs> okay, so so in the encyclopedia, uh, our relationships just open to relationships, and the and that that'll give you everything. I think. So what you do is actually rubbing my eyes on this one. So. What you do is you go out, you get ice cream, and you tell her that she's six. And that this isn't something that you need to worry about for, for many years. A chef from South Park once said, there's a time and a place for everything, and it's called college. And I feel like that's a good point, that that's a good direction to take. So I, I will say a lot of six-year-olds get married to a lot of six-year-olds and then forget that they got married. It's It's not that important. <laughs> yeah, just... Let it be. Not not something that needs to be worried about. Uh, Brian Jellerson asks our final question this week. What are your top five destinations for a darkness retreat? Oh, boy. Um, so so when, when Rogers said, okay, so this is about Aaron Rodgers, who has indicated that he won't come to a uh, decision on whether or not to retire or to play, and he hasn't said what to play means, right? Because he could play for the Packers or for another team, but not come to a decision until he uh, meditates on it at a darkness retreat. And so uh, it's like a sensory isolation retreat, not just a darkness retreat, but one of the senses that you're isolated from is light or vision really, but light cuts it off, right? So um, apparently it's a home in an, and again, James, if once I finish, correct me on anything, um, but it's like a home in an undisclosed location or a cabin or something. And uh, there's no, he's not going to bring his phone uh, or a computer. There's no screens. There's no way to really contact the outside world. Um, and it's got like blackout curtains or it's all walls or something, right? There's no light coming in and meals will be delivered and meals were delivered via two different slots, I guess. So the food will arrive, but you won't see light when you grab the food because it's going through the darkness slot, I guess, which to me, that's probably not sensory isolation because you're tasting food, but it seems like a necessary requirement. No, what um, it sounds like is solitary confinement in prison. Okay. Like, so, okay. But here's the thing though. There is a substantial difference here. One of the stressors of solitary confinement is an inability to leave. The knowledge that Aaron Rodgers can leave whenever he wants is, is different. It's so, and they've done experiments on this. It's substantially different psychologically, and it's not torture in the same way, or at all even. Um, it's the inability to leave plus the confined space. I mean, there's a whole house. He's not going to sensory isolate in a bathroom, right? It's a whole house. So I think those two things probably matter. Also, he did say that he thinks that sensory isolation means he's going to experience um, ayahuasca-like uh, uh, symptoms, the right word, side effects. I don't know. Um effects uh, without actually taking ayahuasca. He's confirmed he's not taking ayahuasca and that it, it, it stimulates the body's natural capacity to produce DMT, which is like a very Joe Rogan thing to say. Yeah. But so, I, it, that is different than solitary. I'm just going to say it's different than solitary confinement. To quote Jeremy Reisman on Twitter, I find it fascinating that rich people enlightenment tactics are nearly identical to prison punishments. Yeah, I mean, that's pretty good. Actually. So... Here's the thing. I'm convinced this was one of those, like, I'm going to say this and just see how the media, like, explodes on this. I refuse oh, to believe he's actually going to do it. 
I okay, but here's the thing. Like, so he likes to say stuff to see how the media responds, right? He loves to poke and be like, "Ah, I got you. It's, it's proof my social experiment works." I was only pretending to be an idiot, right? Um, I that's you know a thing, but like he does take this stuff particularly seriously. Like he, he believes the stuff, one hundred percent. There's no like this is too long of a con. I have talked to too many people that know him well enough. He believes this. Like I 100% think that this is uh, him actually going to a darkness retreat. I want to see him as he emerges from it. Like, I just want to see him like having to like deal with the light. I'm wondering if it's going to look like Boggs from, uh, uh, from the, from the movie Shawshank Redemption when they open it up and like, he's been in there for, for a long time and like stumbles out. Like, it, I, I was thinking of uh, when Jim Carrey gets out of the barrier of the Truman Show. Yeah. Like, like I mean, and, and it's not like he's seeing light for the first time, but he's seeing the world for the end. He's like squinting in the same way, stumbles out in the same way. You know, it's entirely possible that he's just doing this as a way of trying to avoid or to get uh, to like go to where he is. That like shadow man thing. They got reported that he was seeing yeah, like it's, it's, it, re- reported is a strong word, but yeah. Well, yes, <laughs> like he's he's going to his <laughs> he's going to his realm instead. Yeah, the I mean, shadow man realm. I mean, you can't. It, it's all shadow. You you can't appear out of anywhere. What a dumb like I I hate how much time we spend on dumb Aaron Rodgers things. Like they're funny, but like this is just stupid. And there's better Aaron Rodgers things to cover, like the PowerPoint thing that he did that Justice had to sit through. And I realize this is the third time I brought up Justice, but like that PowerPoint was ridiculously stupid. And I, I will have to say, Justice is not how you chose to sit through it. I'm this is a pain of Justice's own cause. <laughs> like, I can't even imagine. Sitting and watching that and, and like, we're talking, we're talking about a guy that watched the Pro Bowl and then rewatched it to grade it. Okay. (laughs) He's living rent free right now. (laughs) (laughs) What, what ridiculousness have we wrought? Uh, This is why he's the LVP. uh, As for the top five locations, obviously the Vatican is, is going to be in number five. Uh, I think Death Valley, I think, is up there. Death Valley is an excellent place. Uh, there's a, a, a little spot out by uh, Mount Everest. It's got a great view once you leave, but this is a great it's place a to have. Spot by Everest. But there's a you great. You make it sound like it's like around the corner. Like ah, I know this great diner. Oh yeah, it's 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 over Actual by night. it's over by the, the the guy with the like the weird neon shoes. Like it's it's that one. So like <laughs> yeah. that's your landmark if you need to find it. But there's a little there's a little shack there. It'll be fine. Uh, the B 52s love shack is also a great place for this uh, sort of thing. And, um, boy, a camper outside of a uh, camper outside of what will soon be the Chicago bears stadium. Also, he owns the bears. So I assume that he can go onto the land that the bears purchased. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. This, this all there seems appropriate. <laughs> this little place over by Mount Everest. It's kind of hard to find, but it's, it's, it's good. Uh, that is going to be it for this episode of Norse Code. Hope you guys have enjoyed it. Uh, Arif, where can they find your work? Um, you can find me over at profitballnetwork.com slash author slash a Hassan. I'm publishing like two articles a day here. This is crazy. Um, I, uh, publishing at like 9 a.m. Eastern tomorrow, uh, is a ranking of every Super Bowl. I watched like all of them and I wrote like 18,000 words, please God read it. Oh my God, Jesus Christ. Um, <laughs> That's, I, that is quite the plea. I, I did. I watched so much bad football. <laughs> um, to, I watched all the Vikings losses. I watched all the Super Bowl uh, to, to rank them. And uh, it, it sounds not worth it. I, I hope it is. Please read it. Also, I um I, I wrote some pretty good pieces too. But I wrote uh, a piece on uh, on Jalen Hurts and his path to leadership and kind of I don't really write a lot of human interest type stories, but I thought Jalen Hurts' story was like pretty interesting and 
kind of the the his ability to kind of become a leader wherever he is or command the respect of leadership even after he's been banished was compelling enough i wrote about that um i was at the goodell presser and i wrote about kind of how i was a little bit disappointed about his answers uh with regards to um black representation in coaching and in playing uh, especially the quarterback position um and so those are all for approval the network you can follow me on twitter at rufus on nfl well, that's going to be it for this episode of Norse Code. I hope you guys have enjoyed it. We'll be back soon with more Norse Code. So for uh, from Arif, my name is James. Thank you guys so much for listening. And please remember that this is not sustainable. And we'll be back in a couple of weeks. Norse Code is the largest and only division of Norse Code LLC. You can find Norse Code on the Daily Norseman, SB Nation's Vikings blog at dailynorseman.com. You can also find it on iTunes, Apple Podcast, Spotify, Stitcher, Google Play, and wherever fine podcasts are aggregated. Our Vikings blogger extraordinaire and generally useful human is Arif Hassan of Pro Football Network! And he can be found at Arif Hassan NFL. I am your producer and host, and my name is James Pagoshnik. You can find me at the show's official Twitter feed, at Norse Code DN, or my personal account, at Big Mono. If you'd like to donate a few bucks to the show, you can do so in a few different ways. You can go to patreon.com slash norsecode and donate there. For $3.50 a month, you get bonus material and more. You can also go to paypal.me slash norsecode for a one-time donation, or you can go to norsecode.threadless.com and pick up some Norse Code merchandise. Any questions or comments that cannot fit in a tweet can be sent to norsecodepodcast at gmail.com. On behalf of the Norse Code staff, thank you so much for listening. Our formula is this. Hey, all things are possible through the power of Ben DiNucci.